first Sunday after Christmas, the tempo of the church here invites us to complete the story as we find in Luke's Gospel, often referred to as the Festival of the Holy Family. Today we hear the one story we find anywhere in the scriptures in any detail that happened during Jesus' childhood. Now his parents would go up every year to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up, as usual, for the festival. And when the festival was ended and they were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know that he had done this. Supposing that he was traveling with them in their company, they went a day's journey. And when they began to look for him among their relatives and friends, they could not find him. And so immediately they went back to Jerusalem. Three days later, they found him in the temple, sitting with the teachers and listening to them. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and at his answers. But his parents were astounded by this. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have been searching everywhere for you with great anxiety. But Jesus said to their Kirk, Why did you search for me? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? But they did not understand his words. However, he went down with them to Nazareth and continued to be obedient to them. And his mother treasured these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in years and in both divine and human favor. This is the word of the Lord. Did you know that 2,300 people go missing every day? I was astounded when I came across that. But if you think about the population and the proportions of the population and the number of times there's either a disenchanted adolescent running away from home, an amber alert for a child that has been swiped by a runaway parent, the more tragic instances that we see in news coverage, the variety of circumstances in which some people just will to get lost and fade away. We have to be standing around waiting for the other day at Walmart. I've never seen this wall of pictures before. There were pictures of missing children. And you follow some of them. One was a picture taken in the 30s of someone who would be in their 70s now. There's still a picture up out there somewhere identifying this person is missing. 2,300 a day. An event of tragic proportion. And 2,300 families or people in significant relationship every day who face the uncertainty and trauma that comes when separated from a loved one. My guess is most any of us who have been through the experience of parenthood have probably also been through the experience of at least a temporary separation or having a child go missing. In many instances, like the one I remember, it was more a matter of minutes than hours. Some might be hours rather than days. But the emotional impact in which seconds feel like hours is equally strong when a child goes missing. I said earlier we don't have school age children anymore, but we do have school teacher age children. <laughs> and our son Jeff was with us today. And some of you may remember a couple of years ago, it was in the children's moment then, uh, but you all get to benefit from the same story today, that I remember one way, and I don't know if it's different the way he remembers it, I love to do this. I want you all to say, this is my little guy. But let's hear from your vantage point. Let's hear from your vantage point. What happened that day at Kmart? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories, uh, though at the time it was frightening. If you remember Kmart like I remember Kmart when I was growing up in the 80s, which was the best time for any child to grow up, <laughs> uh, Kmart was 
like what Walmart is now. It was the place. And for me, Kmart was the place where I got two things, coloring books and He-Man figures. <laughs> and He-Man was the big, the big thing when I was growing up. So I was heading to Kmart with my dad one day, and I have no idea what dad wanted at Kmart, but I know what I wanted. Coloring books and He-Man figures. So that was the first place I was going to walk into Kmart. A little sidebar, by the way, every time I walked into Kmart, every Kmart, no matter where it was, smelled the same. Yes, thank you. Yes, they all smelled the same. But no matter where you are, you walk in, I'm in Kmart. And you know it. The Kmart by my house has turned into a, ho a Hobby Lobby, and even the Hobby Lobby smells can't stop the old Kmart smell. <laughs> like, you walk in, I'm like, oh, this was a Kmart. You can No. So I walked in and I enjoyed the smell. Yes, and that smell signified to me, I have the power of Grayskull. So I knew where I was going. I was pretty excited, so I just ran, beeline to the power of Grayskull, all the He-Man figures, and I was very, very excited. Right? So I grabbed one that I wanted. I'm like, yeah, this is the one I want. Dad! No, he wasn't there at all. <laughs> so I was like, and then that is the that moment kind of like when you see in horror films where that hallway gets longer and longer and longer. <laughs> so this aisle got longer and longer and longer. I'm just standing there with this figure in my hand. And I did what I do best when I need help. I started crying. <laughs> so I just started crying to stand there. And people are looking at me and not doing anything. So that's all. It's a crying job. Let's move along, honey. Uh, Merry Christmas, kid. And so I'm just, uh, you know, just sitting there. And then, uh, thankfully, I don't know how long it was, but it seemed about eight or nine years uh, as I'm standing there. Finally, my father comes running, and that's quite a sight because you can see him running. He came running this way. And I mean, the relief was gone, but I was also kind of frustrated, you know. It's like, what are you doing? I didn't know why we came here, right? It's like, why, I mean, it's kind of like in the story. Like, why did you have to look for it? Did you not know where I would be? It's He Man. He Man or coloring books. That's where you'll find them. Uh, but it was a story that is stuck with me, and um, I'm glad I was able to share with you this morning. So, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Some stories are fanciful. They take that basic dynamic and put it on a extreme, a bizarrely extreme scale. And that's the kind of thing movies are made of. 1990, the hit holiday movie had a storyline roughly like this. When the McAllister family left on their Christmas vacation, they forgot one small thing. <laughs> Did you lock up? Yeah. <coughs> Did we set the timers on the lights? There's other children, there's other brothers and sisters, 
and that pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem for feast days, in many instances, and in most instances, wherever possible, would be in extended family companies or close relationship companies. You traveled in groups for safety's sake, to help sustain you on the journey, and pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover is like going home for Christmas. It's the high holy day of the year. It's the festival of the people's freedom. It's a joyous time. I mean, while it's a religious duty, it's something that's done joyfully. And so you can imagine that caravan moving that familiar pathway, the road down from Jerusalem to Jericho, heading across the Kidron Valley and over the Mount of Olives, and down the long descent along with the old Roman aqueduct that takes water down to the Jordan Valley, beginning that long trek back towards Galilee, probably singing and telling stories and continuing the festive celebration. In my mind's eye, particularly against the backdrop of Home Alone, I kind of picture them looking around and saying, well, of course, and there's, as we know from Mark, there's Simon and Joseph and, and Judas and the sisters and, and Jesus and Jesus! <laughs> Kevin! <laughs> when they became aware, they returned immediately to Jerusalem. And now the story gets even stranger. Three days. <coughs> Jerusalem's a big city, but three days? How extensively they must have looked in so many places. And as we hear the story, as Jeff was just saying, oh, he man, we wonder why would the temple be three days into the search? Why would it be the last place they would go and look? Especially the story that Luke has been telling us in Luke's gospel. A story that begins in the temple with Zechariah the priest given the promise that he and his wife, though childless in their old age, would become parents, that their son would be the prophet that would go ahead of the Messiah. And the story of John's birth comes as a playful and beautiful overlay with the story of the announcement and the birth of Jesus as well. It begins in the temple. Luke's gospel ends in the temple with disciples after the risen Lord spending day and night in the temple praising and glorifying God. When we're told about his birth, we're told that after circumcision at eight days, again, following the customs and laws of the people, of the, the covenant, the, the Torah, the law, they took him to the temple for dedication. It was in the temple that an old man named Simeon saw them and recognized the identity, the essence of who this baby was, and said, now I can die in peace because I've seen the fulfillment of God's promise. It was there in the temple that Anna, the prophet, talked about this child to all who were looking for the deliverance and the redemption of Israel. So the temple has already, in Luke's gospel, been a setting for the center of God's light and presence among the people. And what we seem to be nudging towards in this recognition about Jesus is that it's the only place that he would be, and yet the reason that we don't put him there is three days into the experience before he's found there. I love the dynamic that occurs. We're told two different things. One, he was sitting with the teachers, listening, asking and answering questions. There's some cues here. <coughs> sitting is what the rabbis and teachers do. Asking questions and answering, and People being impressed, both with his understanding and with the kinds of answers he had and questions that he asked, tells us that Jesus, at age 12, still a year short of his bar mitzvah, was engaged in one of the most valued activities within Jewish culture, what's called sacred argument. Now, argument is not a negative thing in this context, but it's the practice among the rabbis and the teachers to raise the ultimate questions, to offer different points of view, to engage one another. We're told that Jesus at age 12 is clearly identified as engaged in that process. It's out of whack with what his parents expect. If they thought that's where he'd be, they'd gone there sooner. If they said that's what he'd be about, they wouldn't have been as astounded as they obviously are when he raises the answer 
Why did you search for me? Don't you know that I would be in my father's house? What an interaction. And this is where you know that something has to get lost in translation from Aramaic to other ancient languages, eventually to Greek to English. For it to come out to say, child, why are you doing this to us? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. <laughs> I just wouldn't talk that way after finding a child after three, after three days. It was a poignantly human interaction as far as what Mary is moving through. And an interesting, ironic response that Jesus makes. And we hear this and say, why do we have this story? Why do we only have it here in Luke? Why do Luke think this is important to tell us? Because it is a fragment kind of story. The other gospel writers don't tell us hardly anything about Jesus' childhood. But here we have this very vividly detailed story from Luke. Why do stories from the childhood of great leaders get told? And let me hearken on one that any of us who've been through grade school have probably heard of. It was told by Parson Williams in the biography of George Washington that he wrote shortly after George Washington's death. I could probably call one of you to tell the story right now, and you can tell it. That George Washington was given a hatchet or an axe by his father as a gift, that he went out and trying it out, cutting down the prize cherry tree. His father asked him about the cherry tree and what had happened. And what did George Washington say? <laughs> and do we absolutely know and trust that this is actual, accurate history? <laughs> Parson Weems wrote his biography in tribute and identified particular stories that link in childhood the values associated with that George Washington's life and work. Now, the challenge about it historically has been uh, the absence of similar accounts in, in other biographical details and so forth. Hopefully, no one knows, finally. And don't get me wrong, I'm not bringing this up to say that the story about Jesus in the temple is like George Washington and the cherry tree in the sense of any real test of its historical accuracy. The point is, however, that I believe that Luke was doing something very similar to what Parson Williams was doing with the story about George Washington. He's less concerned about all the documented historical <coughs> evidence for it. But it's such a beautiful story it had to be told because what it lifted up and identified in childhood that was already emerging in the life of this great leader. For George Washington, it was honesty and integrity. And what is it that we're remembering, or that Luke wants us to remember, in telling the story about Jesus as boy in the temple in Jerusalem? He was committed to the culture of sacred argument. He was counter to the way many would see him, and the way some later non-canonical gospel writers would tell stories about him. Not a wonderful way, superhuman in his attributes, creating birds out of mud pies to impress his playground friends, or striking the ill-tempered parents of some of his other friends with illness when they did something wrong to him. He had some of those kind of stories around in the Gospels and didn't make it into the Bible. But what Luke would have us remember is one who lived in two worlds in a powerful and compelling way. He was obedient to his parents. He went back to Nazareth and remained obedient to them. He was rooted in the traditions of his religion. He continued to be throughout his life, not to destroy the law, to, to fulfill it. And he continued to live out those norms and values fully and completely in his life as well. He was at the same time one who, even at age 12, was coming to terms with a claim that God had on him that God only knows how fully he understood it at that time, but the language he gave to it was, I'm in my father's house. <coughs> that in that basic process of commitment to learning, to sharing in a faithful way and dialogue within the faith community, in responding to what God calls for and claims in our lives, that he was both modeling for us a way to follow and was living out a call and a claim on his own life that would show again and again that his true home was the temple, that his true family was and always will be all who 
follow the will of God and enter into covenant relationship through him. And that these stories, scant as they are, that tell us about the experience of childhood, give us a point of connection and familiarity. As we see not only his experience, but ultimately a link to our own life and our own experiences. You've probably heard a key phrase in the story. To me, I think it's the key to what Luke is about in including this and in telling the whole story about Advent and Christmas and Jesus' childhood. He went back to Nazareth with them and became and remained obedient, and his mother treasured these things in her heart. It's not the first time we've heard that phrase. It's the third time since the beginning of Luke's Gospel. You remember a couple of weeks ago when Alex told you the story about the birth of John and at the naming of John, Zachariah, who had not been able to speak, up to that time was able to speak and people were filled with awe and fear and word went about this throughout the whole surrounding country in Judea and all who heard it treasured these things, pondered and treasured these things, saying, who could this child be? For surely God's hand is upon him. You're more familiar probably with the phrase in the, in the traditional birth story in Luke 2, the story you heard told on Christmas Eve, that while shepherds were telling everyone what they heard about this child and who it was, Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. And Jesus returned to Nazareth and was obedient to them, Luke tells us, and Mary treasured these things in her heart. When we're working in biblical storytelling, learning and growing a story, one of the things we're always told to pay attention to is phrases that repeat themselves. Key words are phrases that repeat themselves. That's not accidental. The storyteller's doing that for a purpose. So if three times in two chapters in Luke we keep hearing this, what's Luke trying to tell us? Unusual, life-changing things going on. People are designated for some great work, the hand of God must be on them. Keep these things in your heart. Mary, in the very act of birth and hearing all the reaction, rather than try to speak the unspeakable, ponders these things in her heart. The child, who's obviously bigger than life and already out beyond them, still comes and lives among them and is obedient to them. And Mary treasures these things in her heart. I believe that's Luke, kind of standing back behind the back curtains, sticking his head through each time and saying, Psst, you're supposed to treasure this in your heart. Pay attention to what's happening here. These wonderful stories that fill this season, that are part of the foundation of our life of faith, let them not be dulled in over familiarity. But again and again we're told that the one who was God incarnate, living in our midst, took on the most <laughs> full and complete form, that of a mildly rebellious 12-year-old, <laughs> who was doing so because of the deep presence and the deep call of fame on his life. Know that that treasure in your heart, let it be the source of encouragement and hope and guidance for whatever journey we're on, whatever new experience may lie ahead for us. One of the things that I missed this year, a favorite part of that Christmas, is the King's College presentation of Nine Lessons and Carols. A glorious musical service based on the prophecies and the birth stories that begins every year with a boy soprano singing the first stanza of the not too familiar carol, Once in Royal David City. Stanzas of that that continue and that we'll sing in just a moment. To me, echo what's at work in this story. For Jesus was our childhood's pattern. Day by day, like us, he grew. He was little, weak, and helpless. Tears and smiles, like us, he knew. So he shares in all our sadness, and he feels all our gladness. The one who comes yet again in our midst is one with whom we journey from this Christmas Eve <coughs> into the unknowns and the certainties that lie ahead. We do so with confidence that because he comes and lives among us, 
we find the ultimate presence of power and new life. And at last, our eyes shall see him through his own redeeming love. For that child who seems so helpless now reigns and lives in heaven above. And he leads all his children on to the place where he is.